Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I want to give a shout out to other tribal elders in the back here that I see, my brother and sister in law. Um, I want to start because I think it's really important to um, get steeped in a sense of place here. So, You'll bear with me, I'm going to do my version of a land acknowledgement and an opening blessing <clears throat> in my language. So, Katabatash Katantawa, Uchi Wami, Utamawa Ka Nutamsawa, Katabatash Katantawa, Uchi Wami, Nawiya Nakan, Oniti Awang, Katabatash Katantawa, Uchi Kisak, Katabatash Katantawa, Uchi Nipalus Ka Nutamsawa, Katabatash Katantawa, Uchi Kitan. Sorry to slide. I pull up the stage. We really have a problem. Katabta Shkatantwa Uchi Namas Ka Wita. Katabta Shkatantwa Uchi Napeshawa Ka Peshawa. Katabta Shkatantwa Uchi Namasawa. Katabta Shkatantwa Uchi Sokanun Kacha Usha Niampaog. Ka white lupayanash. Nashki Mishitashin Young Wag Kachisatao. Kakantamu Wami Sakwan Kisakwan Tukwanik Paponi Pashao Nashki Wunitiya Wang. Katab Tashkatantua Wuchi Chishwan Gonag. Kakantam Kwam at Kisapishwam Gash at Anantam. Mahal ka nashuang, ka nashuang ku kuchisamai ang kung ginawan. Kakantamu ginaw akone wami ishkoni. Katabtas katantwa uchi wami wanian siniyan ukasaki. Nanipan mai vi at utan tam wane tamiana. Nanipan mengwaya at when the two on on Tom, then in a mist to walk. Katamtash Uchi Wami Kamak Wanash Namanach. So, what I said to you in my language is I said, Thank you to the Creator for all our friends and relatives. Thank you, Creator, for all the beauty that surrounds us. Thank you to the Creator for this beautiful day, for the sun and the clouds. Thank you, Creator, for the ocean and the fresh waters. Thank you, Creator, for the fish and the turtles and the otters and the whales um, and all the creatures of the sea. Thank you, Creator, for the, the forests. Thank you for the birds and all the animals. Thank you, Creator, for the fish. Thank you, Creator, for the rain, the thunder, the lightning, and the winds. And with the storm comes a cleansing. We wish all the seasons, spring, summer, and fall, and winter to burst forth with beauty. Thank you to the Creator for our ancestors who have led the way and taught us what we know today and who have also suffered um, through conquest and colonization, uh, mind, body, and spirit. Their spirits wash over us. We wish for peace in the future and we thank the Creator for all the beauty to enjoy for Mother Earth. We stand together to care for and protect Mother Earth, and we stand together as people. Thank you to the Creator for all the gifts. And so as I bless this day uh, and welcome you, I must acknowledge the 400 years of conquest, colonization, genocide, land dispossession, enslavement, forced assimilation, tribalization, and the erasure of the Narragansett and other indigenous nations of the Americas. I must also acknowledge the bravery, the resilience, the perseverance, and adaptability of our ancestors who ensured our continuation, passing forth our traditional ecological knowledge, language, history, and culture, while contributing to the creation of this colony, state, and country. There is no U.S. history without indigenous people's history, and there is no Rhode Island history without Narragansett, Niantic, and other indigenous people's history. This is our homeland since time immemorial. We are still here. May we always remember 
We are the land. What we do to the land, we do to ourselves. We must care for Mother Earth to ensure our future generations. A land acknowledgement is just the beginning and we must follow it by actions. And that's why we at the Tomahawk Museum can establish the Indigenous Empowerment Center and share traditional ecological knowledge and represent museum exhibits and programs from a first person perspective and partner with organizations like this um, to ensure diversity, equity, access, inclusion, and justice. Katabatash Akwane Kani Nanto. Thanks, peace, and blessings. So this song was actually passed down to me, um, well, I guess from my ancestors and elders, as I heard it as a child, but I didn't know it to sing it as a child. Um, Elise Katow, um, late Elise Katow, she, um, a tribal elder and historian and uh, medicine person and culture bearer, um, she went with us with students to Washington, D.C. Uh, about 15 years ago. And during a ceremony, she sang this song. <clears throat> and I asked her if she would sing it with me a few times till I knew it, because I remembered it as a child. And it literally means, um, it's Huna Weekend, um, we dwell here. It's the idea that our people are here in this land, in these grounds. Um, our stories are here, our language is here, our culture, our life ways, our, our entity and identity is from this place. So we dwell here. relationship, 
and we all have different levels of relationships. So there's some people in this room I've known my whole entire life. There's other people I've known for the last five years or so. And then there's other people I'm meeting today. Well, that's true for all of the things in our ecosystem as well. We have different levels of relationship with those um, gifts of the land and the waters. We have to understand that we have to build relationship with those beings. We have to understand it's a, a relationship of reciprocity. We give and we get, and we give and we get, and there's balance to that. And if we're truly doing it right, we have a symbiotic relationship with those gifts of the land. Just quickly, um, some ideological view differences between Western science and indigenous ways of knowing or traditional ecological knowledge. Often Western ideologies are very structured in mathematics and measurement and products of thought. It's independent, it's proof, um, it's experimentation, it's protocols, it's linear. Um, it's without spirit. Um, Western scientists that I've done professional development training with have gotten very upset with me when I talk about ceremony in science. Um, they are looking for constants and regularities and laws. And my favorite example is they have to prove something. And whether they're right or wrong in their proof, they're still proving it from their perspective. So archaeologists for many a year said the Narragansett didn't eat corn. Why? They hadn't proved it. I don't know where they thought all the ceremonies we have come from brown corn came from, but nonetheless, they hadn't proved it until they found Site 110, and they found the big corn caches, and they're like, oh, they do eat corn, and they did eat corn, imagine that. And then they're like, well, but we only went found one little tiny fragment of a squash seed, so maybe they didn't really eat squash, who knows. Um, but that's kind of the difference. In their way of thinking, they have to prove it, and if they can't prove it, then it's not real. And in traditional ideologies, it's that idea of sacredness and livingness. It's about your life and your community and what you do. It's about spirit, it's about energy, it's about interconnectedness. It's about relationships, as I stated before. It's about culture, it's about community, it's about perspective and your worldview. It's about um, networks and patterns and webs, or if we want to be cliche, circles of life. Um, about being animate um, and thinking of things in that same respect that a life is a life, whether it's a human life, an animal life, or a plant life, it's a life. And so you have to live with that respect. It's about cycles and renewal and ceremony. It's about constant change. And so it's looking at it from a different worldview and a different lens. And then just quickly, this is a whole list of sciences today, right? The things that we think of as science. Everything in TEK is in these terms that are modern world terms, right, for science. And I'm not gonna stay on that for very long, but I just wanted just to ground you in that space. So TEK, it's a way to understand the world. When our children are learning science in a traditional ecological way, they are learning about the world around them. They're learning about how things happen. They're under learning and understanding and explaining relationships. They're understanding their existence in time and space. They're expressing their culture, their community, their life ways. And in this picture is my brother-in-law, Cassius, who happens to be in the back of the room. And I'm pretty sure he's probably speaking a little later. Um, and he is the, along with his wife Dawn, are the founders of the Narragansett Food Sovereignty Initiative. And they now house that at Ashawag Farm. And so, seeing him holding this corn, for me, is very much about relationship. It's about relationship between us and the land. It's about relationship with us and our community. It's about relationship between us and the rest of the people in the world that we're sharing knowledge with. Um, it's about all of those things and many more. But I'm gonna frame a few things around corn uh, just to show the importance of one gift, one gift from the creator. So, maniash or corn, 
is really important in our community for so many different reasons. Most people, they think corn and they only think about edible reasons that corn would be important. But corn is very important because it's literally a symbol of fertility. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. It's part of wedding ceremonies. One of the gifts I got when I got married was a corn knocker for your door. And because it's about that symbol of fertility, literally for your family, but expansively your whole entire community. It re represents sustainability, and of course it was a gift from the creator. And there's a whole story, which I'm gonna tell you in a moment, or at least a short version of, <clears throat> that there was sacrifice. And that gift, that gift of, from the crow, um, is what helped us have maniash here. Because as people who might be anthropologists or archeologists or just like to study plants, they will know that we didn't always have corn here. But we've had it here for thousands of years, so it's definitely um, what people like Robin Wall Kimmerer would say is a naturalized plant, meaning maybe it wasn't indigenous here from the very beginning of time, but it's been here for so long and is so intrinsic in our families and communities that it belongs and it's part of our ecosystem. And instead of being um, an invasive that harms our ecosystem, it actually enhances our communities and families. So, how did the corn come to be here? Um, I'm gonna tell you the very, very short version of this. <clears throat> so, millennia ago, or as Red Wing would say, many, many, many moons ago, uh, the people, the Nahai Gansak, they lived on this land and they were very industrious and they worked within the seasons. When the spring season came, they harvested the maple sap and made uh, maple syrup and maple sugar and maple candy. They harvested the spawning fish, the salmon and the herring. And as the seasons progressed, they harvested the berries and the field greens and um, gathered all the foods. And as they were in the summer season at their summer village, they were fishing, deep water fishing, shell fishing, uh, clams and quahogs and crabs, all the good stuff that we all are familiar with here in Rhode Island, right? Um, and they were harvesting whales and seals and doing all the work of each season. And as each season progressed, they stored things, they um, dried things, made pemmican and dried meat and pounded it with cranberries and sunflower seeds and harvested their garden, uh, not the garden crops, but their um, forage crops. And as each season went, they gathered the things they need. Well, this one particular year, year the winter months were rough. If you've lived in what we now call southern New England, or if we decolonize it, the southern northeast. Um, if you live in the southern northeast, you may have lived through some winters, and our winters are sporadic, right? But, I don't know, maybe five or six winters ago, it was almost May, and we had like a foot and a half of snow on the ground still. And this was the kind of winter that they had. It snowed, the Sochipo kept falling and falling and falling, and it was so deep, it was up to the tops of the doors of their nushwee toes, and they were concerned because their stores were getting less and less and less. And so, the people started to pray more so. They were asking the creator for some help, Anama Ikwa creator, because we need help. We have less and less food. There's not enough. We're starting to have a starving time. And despite the fact that our hunters were amazing hunters, the snow was hindering the hunting of game. It was hindering ice fishing. And all the things they could drive and preserve were no longer there. And so the nuts, and the dried berries, all of those things were gone. And so they prayed, and the Creator answered their prayer, and they, the Creator came down and spoke with their leaders and said, you have to send your most strong warrior. You need to give them to me, and they have to go on a journey. And so they said that Kanat Mushitash and his wife and she said, me, Makasanash for him, and an extra robe to be worn, a bear hide fur, and they did ceremony, they sang songs, and 
the creator said he's going to be gone for a very, very long time. It's a long journey. And he had to journey to Salonayu, the Southwest. And as he journeyed, he sang songs of thanksgiving and he nibbled on things as he went along, along with the last bits of dried meat and dried fish that were sent with him. And when he made it many, many moons later to the top of a mesa in the Southwest, the creator said, you've done good, you've sacrificed for your people, and now I have a gift for your people. And Kenneth Masikash said, I, I, I don't know if I can make it all the way back. And the creator said, you don't have to. You've done your job, you've sacrificed for your people, and so now I'm gonna give you the gift, and the crow is going to be the one to deliver that gift. And so the crow flew from the southwest to the east and came to the dawnlands, <clears throat> and landed in the ceremonial circle. And all the people came out and, and gathered round and the crow did this little hop and out of one ear came a corn kernel and did another hop and out of the other came a bean kernel at seed. And from this day forward, corn and beans are often served together. And so those foods became sustaining foods for our people, which allowed us to be really tall uh, Barazan was quoted as saying something about how we're so tall and stately. Uh, and I think that's true because of the foods. And if you think about you know, sustainability here, in this southern northeast, we have a lot of diversity of food sources from fresh water to salt water to uh, coastal to inland to um, wetlands and so forth. And so food is really important. It's about our communities, um, our stories come from our life ways and from our ceremonies. Um, food is medicine, one, because it's nutritious and keeps us healthy, but literally food is medicine. And food all, um, is also connected. Those food systems are connected to what today we might call art or utilitarian art. Um, but we call it cultural expression. So we don't even actually have a word in our actual language for the word art. So with that, I'm gonna move a little quicker here and just kind of connect you to corn. So we have corn meal Johnny cakes or journey cakes as they were originally called because you know, the next time someone had to go on a journey, once the corn came to be here, the splint corn, you could put it in your pouch um, as no cake or just dry cornmeal and add water to it and you could eat it. Um, you could have these uh, cornmeal cakes um, that you could take with you on a journey. Um, and then you could make corn cakes that are a little more um, uh, fluffy, if you will, uh, with uh, different kinds of ground flowers, including corn flour. Succotash, if you haven't had it, is a corn and bean dish. Uh, corn chowder, we all know what chowder is, so envision clam chowder. If you've never had corn chowder, instead of clams, it's corn. <laughs> and uh, hominy corn soup, which is a different kind. It's made um, differently um, with the harmony uh, corn. And with that, we celebrate 13 Thanksgivings in our community. And 13 moons, so our lunar calendar has 13 cycles and 13 Thanksgivings, and they're often connected to the harvest. It doesn't mean that we don't have other ceremonies for foods and food harvesting, but these are big community-wide Thanksgivings. Um, and today, we sometimes refer to them as moons and sometimes as Thanksgivings, we kind of intermix the words. Um, in the top left, uh, picture that's a corn planting moon ceremony um, at Tomahawk Museum quite a few years ago now, maybe 15 or so years ago. And on the right is the Green Corn Thanksgiving, or what is known today as the Narragansett August Meeting uh, powwow, which is the oldest recorded native gathering in the nation. I think this year is 346, or might be 47. COVID's gotten confused. Um, and then at the bottom, we have a mortar and a pestle because flint corn, of course, has to be ground. Um, and then those colonial folks that came along made some mills to grind it in a different way. So we have corn and beans, which I mentioned came with the crow, but we married that with squash. And that became the Three Sisters. And the Three Sisters is a great example of interdependence, companion planting, um, having a symbiotic relationship. So the corn 
grows tall as the big sister. The bean wraps around the corn stalks and that anchors the, the beans and it gives nitrogen to the soil. And the squash has really big leaves and covers the mounds, keeping in the moisture and keeping away the weeds. But that relationship goes beyond those three plants. It goes to Yukasaki, the whole earth, Mother Earth. And it connects to the water, even the fresh water of the rivers, lakes, ponds, the springs, the, the groundwater, soaking in the rain. It connects to the salt waters because these gardens were kept in our pre-contact times, um, in our summer villages by the salt ponds and the salt marshes and the open ocean. And so we fertilize those grounds with fish and seaweeds and ground shell um, that gave balance to the soil. We also put burned wood ash in there as well. And so we have this interrelationship between animals and plants, the land, the water, and of course the soil itself has all kinds of nutrients in it, as well as insects and other living things, um, microorganisms. And so it's a great example of the whole interrelationship there. And then there's human power, right? So humans come along and they, oh, they create agriculture and they farm, and that takes work. It takes human work. We have to give to those plants. We have to care for them. We have to tend them. We have to give tend the soil to make sure it's nutrient rich. When we do all the right things, then we get abundance back as gifts of the land. And those plants give us those gifts back. And so it's really important. And because of that, it's sacred. And because of that, we do ceremony. And we give thanks for all of those gifts, the gifts of their life for our lives. Because without those gifts, we would not survive. So there's many technologies and resources that goes along with TPK, right? In order to garden, you need some tools. So here's an example of a deer shoulder hoe. Um, in order to grind that corn, you need the mortar and the pestle. In order to store that corn, you might need this beautiful seed pot. Um, but you also have uh, deer antler rakes and other kinds of tools that you can use in your garden. And those connect with the different plants and animals and, and resources in our ecosystem that um, we're using. We also have things that are um, what people today might call arts. This is a, a lovely corn washing basket. I will say native students from the Wichuan School along with a, 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 a my brain just went on a fog. I'll say Iroquois because my brain just wouldn't work at this moment. Um, artist who um, helped them make that corn washing basket. There's a corn husk mat there. And then of course we've got little people with a corn husk doll. So there's many things that you can make from corn husk. Including this basket here, this little basket, is actually a mixture of corn husk and sweet grass. And so there's all these resources and gifts of the land. I did want to um, mention that I, when I um, forgot about it, but now that I looked over there, this is actually Narragansett flint corn, the same flint corn that was grown at um, the, the farm with Cassius and Dawn Spears. It's the historic Narragansett flint corn. It's in my picture, I had a multitude of different kinds of flint corn. So, Yukazaki, Mother Earth, um, and as we said, these things are all connected. It's connected to the cycles of life. It's connected to our stories of how we came to be here. Um, our creation story, one of our most old creation stories, actually says we, we are formed from the clay in the riverbed. So we are literally part of the earth. We are the soil. We are the water. We are the microorganisms. We are connected to this land. Um, and the creator, Katantuvik, provides all that we need. Um, sometimes you might see the words Turtle Island, that's in reference to the Americas, right? All of this land here um, is Turtle Island, and we're thankful and have gratitude for the gifts of those lands. And all of our life ways comes from that. 
Um, and these gifts must be protected for future generations. And in order for us to do that, we need to live in balance. We all need to use more reusable uh, utensils and carry around our own mugs. Um, we need to do more of those things that will help us to be sustainable. So it's this whole idea of TEK is very, very holistic. Um, and you know, when I say holistic, it's because it's, um, science is not a word that we have in our language. We don't have philosophy, we don't have psychology, we don't have art, but that's because all of those things are interwoven into our life ways and who we are and into our ceremony. So the Pawa is a person who leads the ceremony, but that person is also the medicinal healer as well. So science and spirituality and family and community and health and wellness all go together. Um, the ceremonies of seasons uh, for harvesting, hunting, gathering, rites of passage, uh, birth, death, marriage, you know, indigenous people have every kind of ceremony like every other people for families and communities. And those are interwoven into um, your life ways. So I, I think of my eldest nephew right now when he got married and his, so his wife is um, a foreigner to these lands, right? But she's uh, Diné or Navajo from the desert Southwest. So to remind you that all indigenous people are not the same, we're Eastern Woodland Coastal people, right? And so one of the things that I remember the most about the pre-wedding ceremonies is that um, my brother and sister-in-law put on a huge feast. And so those of you that have been from Rhode Island a long time, there was fish and there was crabs and there was caw hogs and there was lobster and there was all these things. And I remember one of the elders from her community, they were like, and they kept making like a face. They had never had seafood ever before in their life because they're from the desert southwest. And so um, they were um, really taken aback by all the seafood. But I will say I was equally taken aback when they had um, the first ceremony and they gave us mutton. I had never had mutton before. So there's lots of things that are connected to that. So each season has a ceremony, um, whether that's maple sugar ceremony, or the strawberry Thanksgiving, or you're harvesting uh, field greens like fiddleheads or medicines like sweet fern. You're collecting all of these things in beautiful um, bark baskets. This is a pine bark basket, but you're making your tools, your materials that you need, your cooking utensils, the, all the things that you need for your life. And you're doing that throughout the seasons. You're hunting and fishing and gathering and gardening and, and building making, um, whether that's your home uh, from cattail mats. But I like to remind people, you see the cattail mats, but you forget the other gifts of this plant, that you can eat the shoots, um, that you can grind the roots into flour, that you can use the pods to line your shoes or soften the bed for your child in their um, cradle board. There's uses for all of it. Um, bulrush, most people look at that and they just go, that looks like grass in the water. Those seeds are edible. Those stems are edible, the roots are edible, and then you can use them as a beautiful gift and make that gorgeous and rush mat for your home. Um, so, and these are just the tip of the icebergs of the gifts. Almost every one of these plants are edible, medicinal, useful, and spiritual. And so that's TEK. Whether you're harvesting things from the salt ponds, and you're turning that gorgeous quahog shell into what we know as wampum today, a wampum peat, um, which is white peat. Those are gifts. Um, wampum is very ceremonial, so it's connected to um, this space and place. And so you can have summer season ceremonies and then have a clam bake afterwards, because you have a ceremony, then you have the festivities and the fun, and we can play some football. Um, you can have your seasons of the fall. Most people are aware of fall harvests. Um, but there's sometimes forget that there's other things that you're harvesting. We harvest a lot of mushrooms in the fall. Um, you can harvest the acorns in the fall, the black walnuts. Um, you can eat those black walnuts, but you also can make dyes out of that for your stamping on your baskets or dyeing for your mats. Um, all of these things are gifts. In here, we've got um, my son when he was young with a great big um, 
it's a chicken of the forest or the hen of the forest. I never know which one it's called, but I know how to, that's one of the other things about TEK is we don't call it the quote unquote right thing. We just know we can eat that. Um, and those, um, uh, what we often call baby sunflowers, which really are sun chokes or Jerusalem otter chokes, the roots of those taste like little baby carrots. Um, whether you're harvesting grapes and you're using the grape leaf as food or using it as a poultice or you're using the berry as a dye, there's all these things that you can do. Um, and one of my favorite harvests is to harvest uh, wild cranberries. How many of you have harvested wild cranberries in Rhode Island? Also, there's a decent number in the room. Good job. Um, because one of the things that we learned, this is a TEK thing, you shouldn't take the first and you shouldn't take them all, but you need to harvest. In this world of thinking about sustainability, we need to understand that when something becomes sort of endangered, then we go from taking everything, meaning humanity, not just me, but humanity overtaking, and then we undertake. It's kind of like um, proper burning of the forest. Um, they make tribal nations stop burning, and then we suffer the consequences now that we didn't do sustained, um, organized burning over all these years, and now we have problems with huge forest fires as we see all over the TV. But my daughter-in-law, who's Paiute, talked about how that became a law that they could not burn. And so those are the kinds of things that are a problem. There were laws that we couldn't harvest bark here in Rhode Island. Well, that stops us from building our homes, making our canoes, harvesting medicines, harvesting technologies like cordage, um, and so forth. So each season, whether it's spring, summer, winter, or fall, gives you those gifts. You can have the gift of, um, of ice fishing and winter berries and pine and cedar. Um, there's all kinds of gifts. Every season gives you what you need. So I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit here because I lost some time along the way. <laughs> so I just wanna quickly go into a little bit of the social justice so I don't lose all the time for that. Um, you know, we have the conflict of conquest and, and the, the bringing of epidemics and the reduction of land and water resources for indigenous populations through the genocide, displacement, enslavement, and land dispossession, and really the idea of the commodification of, of everything here, right? Um, when you commodify the gifts of the land and it's no longer a gift to you, but something that you can commodify and sell, it becomes a problem for, for all of us because of overuse. Um, and the commercialism causes um, just imbalance in the ecosystem. It causes imbalance. We introduce new animals and plants that don't belong here that are not living in balance and often destructive to the ecosystem. And we um, take uh, and destroy the plants that are here. So some of this is connected to our history. Um, I'm showing the hogs that came in and dug up the clam bed, but also the idea that that's a continuation today. It's really important for us to live in balance and think about the strategies of commodification and capitalism and industrialization and urbanization and how that's changing the land and, and creating um, less resources for all of us and causing problems for um, our, our, our way of life, literally, as humans. So that image there is reflecting on Mashapog Pond, which is completely poisoned. And it's the biggest pond in the city of Providence. Um, it had lots of manufacturers, but the most noted is Gorham. And all those toxins, when they didn't know, went and leached into the water. So how do we change that? And they're doing lots of restoration work, but it's gonna take a long time before that is a place that you can swim or fish. Um, there's lots of local issues that go on here um, for indigenous people and all people. Um, one of the things was the Boroughville power plant and the taking of water and, and what, what that would be, the LNG terminals, uh, uh, concerns, um, the toxins that are in our waters. I mean, even here in South County where we still have pretty beautiful spaces and we have designated rivers as wild and scenic um, and we have um, beautiful waterways, we still have a lot of PCB lead and mercury that's getting uh, 
you know, seen in, uh, through the experimentation in those waters. Um, on our own reservation, those ponds have those chemicals in them. They think it comes from acid rain, but they're not 100% sure. So when we think about um, the dog days of summer and they let rip to be free rides because we can't breathe the air properly, um, those of you that are my age or above, I'm 55, if you think about when we were children, we didn't have those days that were non-breathable days. Um, we didn't have days where we had to pay for water and with that we have to struggle to have fresh air. So there's a lot of things to think about. Um, how that affects our health and well-being, our access to these foods and food waste and food systems affect our health and well-being as indigenous people, but also as people in general. Um, it's really um, an issue for indigenous people. To solve some of those things, we work on things like access, access to, to salt ponds. I mean, I'm scheduling meetings with um, powers that be in the state because we keep getting blocked from salt ponds and access. Um, hunting and fishing rights is constantly having to be on the table here in Rhode Island. Um, and just land and water rights as indigenous people in general. There's a lot of reasons. Um, for food systems and food waste, for sure, and health and wellness, but also for ceremonial purposes, why we should have access. Um, we're, we're thankful that Narragansett Town Council approved access to that beach, but really, the state of Rhode Island should grant access to Narragansett people to every state beach, and every town should access, uh, you know, uh, the ability for Narragansett people to be at any beach because of the diaspora of what happened, we're not all in one place. And for some people, based on economics, getting to just to the town of Narragansett could be an, you know, difficult to do. So those are things that I think would be good. So we do a lot of advocacy. Um, obviously, there's lots of things that I've already mentioned, but we'll just keep going. Um, lots of people in our Native community have been working on um, issues around water is life. You know, the Dakota Access Pipeline and other pipelines, whether that's Tar Sands or the Keystone or Ramapo or wherever else. Um, you know, Nipana Kitiawang is how we say water is life in our language. People think of it as a cliche phrase. I want you to really think about it. Water is life. We all need it, just as we need the air that we breathe, and just as it is that we need the food that comes and needs both air and water. We need those things, and if we don't have them, we're not gonna survive as people. So, um, since I feel like I'm out of time, I'm going to stop there and, um, and just let you know that we were thinking about all the things that are affecting us, and certainly climate change is one of them. Um, that, that is impactful um, on this land and on this water, the number of storms and things that we've all suffered. Those of us that have gone through the floods of 2010 or Hurricane Sandy, you see the changes happening. We see them happening at a very rapid rate. So we need to make changes as humans in order to sustain our all collective way of life. And the way that our ancestors would say that is that we would have to look at how we're living. Are we living in balance? Are we living um, symbiotically with Yukas Aki, Mother Earth? Because it's called Mother Earth for a reason. Your mother cares for you, protects you, ensures you have everything that you need. And this earth is trying to do that. But in return, in reciprocity, we have to care for it in order for the earth or our earth mother to give us what we need. We have to care for the earth. So I will stop there and hopefully you'll have a question or two.